Hey everyone, my name is Kevin Chapman and I am from Louisville, Kentucky. And just so you know, if you notice how I said that, if you're ever on a flight and someone says Louisville, you know it's not the same place, amen? It's Louisville or Louisville, that's what we will accept, praise God. All right, so I just wanted to put that out there for you all, all right, or y'all as we say in Kentucky. So with that said, by way of introduction, many of you all may recall that I was on last month with Julianne and we talked a lot about emotional symptoms, panic, anxiety, and whatnot, because by trade, I am a licensed clinical psychologist, right? And I'm the founder and director of the Kentucky Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders. So I'll plug that now. If you need to get in touch and reach out to me, any sort of questions, if I don't respond to you, I promise you I will. It's just that it's in queue. And I've had so much love and edification from you guys from last month. And I'm really grateful for that. So I appreciate it. If you guys have questions, you know, my ministry is in this area. So please reach out to me and uh, just follow up. And I promise you, I'll get back with you when I can. But go to kycards.com. My email address is kevin at kycards.com. Or you can go to my website, my other website, drkevinchapman.com. So just to be clear, I'm not a Christian psychologist. I'm a Christian who happens to be a psychologist. So keep in mind, my worldview is all word, amen? Now I'm trained in science and science is effective. And in many ways, part of my ministry is really to debunk how science and the word of God conflict. And they don't in many ways, right? If you're seeing someone who is a secular clinician, if you will, many ways they don't really see how the word of God, which was established before science, amen, is certainly true and confirms many of the concepts that we teach many of the clients and whatnot that we see. But just to be clear, you know, Julianne is a friend of mine, the Hartman family. We love them and we praise God for this ministry. But we were at family Bible conference at uh, Karis Bible College uh, in July last month. And the, the Lord just downloaded to me um, through a conversation I had with Julianne. And uh, he said, you need to elaborate on many of the things you talked about. But just to be clear, um, I'm thrilled to be the guest this month because I have a word from the Lord that I hope, hope, hope will pierce your heart and implant itself in fertile soil in your heart so that you can, if you have ears to hear, please listen to me because the Lord has given me a word for some of you all watching this whole month of August, okay? So the title of today's message, and it will be four parts, but today what we're gonna break down is understanding a spirit of fear. Understanding a spirit of fear, and I promise, we're going to lay out what that is today, but what we're going to get into after today is we're going to get into specifics. We're going to get into a lot more detail, what the Word of God says about that. I'll infuse, of course, many concepts, emotional concepts and psychological science and whatnot, but I promise you that if you tune in and pay attention to this, some people are going to most certainly have a now word, a rhema word, and we're going to get set free from some things this month. Amen? All right, so let's jump into the Word of God. Let me give you some foundational scriptures. Let me set the table briefly. So if you're writing anything down, let's talk about 1 Thessalonians 5.23. So write that down, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I also want you to write down 2 Timothy 1.7. And I know many of you all are like, yep, we already know where we're going with that, amen. So 2 Timothy 1.7, write that scripture down. I also want you to write down 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, right? And then we're going to write down one we all get excited about. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. So these are what I call some foundational scriptures. They're going to form the basis for many of the concepts that we're going to navigate. Amen. So we're going to talk about a spirit of fear. It's interesting because the wording in the word of God says a spirit of fear, right? It doesn't say the, it says a, and we'll kind of extrapolate that, break it down and talk about how that relates today to many of us who may be viewing this today and many people in the body of Christ who may not be, who may need to watch this and tune in the next time. Amen. So let's break this down. So 1 Thessalonians 5.23, a very powerful scripture. And it says, if you're following along, it says that may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think many of us know, so that scripture breaks down very clearly that we are a three-part being. We have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. So spoiler alert, to say now, I think many of us know 
that our spirit man's never the issue. Amen. Wall to wall, Holy Ghost, completely sanctified, completely redeemed. Our spirit man is rock solid, literally. Amen. So we know that all the DNA of Jesus is there. So let's tuck that away. So we have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. So if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, what it says there is that he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And that word one comes from the Greek word hes, meaning literally a singular one, meaning to the exception of another. It says that we are one spirit with him. So there we go again. We have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. And then it says in that scripture that we are one spirit with the Lord, right? So we have that. So tuck that part away. We're going to put all these together and you're going to see something very important happen here shortly. And then if we go to, of course, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, what we see there is the fruit of the spirit. And of course, you all know the fruit of the spirit. It says for the fruit of the spirit are love, joy, peace, right? Patience or long suffering, kindness, right? Gentleness faithfulness, right? And self-control, right? Goodness and those sort of things. So the thing is, is that if you break down the fruit of the spirit, really to simplify that, that's really saying that those are nine characteristics of the manifestation of Jesus himself. In many ways, the fruit of the spirit are simply saying that those actions toward the Lord, our relationship with him, our relationship to other people, and then our own self-behavior, those three areas are manifestations and our exemplary of Jesus himself. Praise God, that's a good word. And I think that that's so important to take note of. And then of course, we have 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse seven, right? And 2 Timothy chapter one, verse seven says, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So I think we all are aware of that scripture. It says God didn't give us a spirit of fear. So let's break this down. So if we take these scriptures together in context, what we have here is we have this idea that I have a three-part being. I have a spirit, I have a soul, and I have a body, right? Check mark. It says that he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. So we're one with the Lord in spirit, right? Amen. It says in Galatians 5, 22, that the fruit of the spirit, that same spirit, right, are the manifestations of Jesus himself and his character manifested through our relationship with God, our relationship with other people and our own self behavior. Amen. And then it goes on to say that God didn't give us a spirit of fear. So there's a conundrum because in many ways, when we think about these scriptures that we're talking about, we can say and agree that, wait a second, I'm one with the Lord. I'm standing on the word of God. I know that I'm one with him. I know I have the DNA of Jesus Christ living on the inside of me. I know my spirit is sanctified. It's whole. It has all the, the healing power, right? It has all the authority. It has the anointing. It has all those things I need in my life as a believer to navigate. And yet, many of us still struggle with what we call a spirit of fear. Now, we know God didn't give that to us. We've made that very clear. Everyone watching, just to be clear, I know y'all know that, but many people, just so you know, God didn't give us that. We know that, right? Amen. So there's an issue. So if God didn't give us a spirit of fear, then something else is going on here, right? So we know that our spirit is completely there. We know that it's sanctified. It has the DNA of Jesus, right? The bottom line is that our spirit's not the issue. So what is it then? that we struggle with? What is it about us? What is it that we're still paying attention to, if you will, that if I know as a born again believer that I have access and I'm completely perfected in my spirit, then why do I still struggle, right? We've had to ask this question in the past. Why do I still struggle? I'm standing on the word of God. I'm standing on these scriptures. I'm speaking and declaring and confessing, right? And if this is for somebody right now, but this is not a lack of faith, just to be clear, because so oftentimes people say, well, you don't have enough faith, right? The word of God says that for God gave us the measure of faith. You have the faith. But what we find is that many believers still struggle with this idea that although I have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwelling on the inside of me, I still struggle on a day to day basis, though I'm in the word, though I'm seeking God, though I'm praying. 
and whatnot. And yet I still seem to be bound by something I know God didn't give me that the word of God calls a spirit of fear. Right. So the whole purpose of everything we're going to navigate this whole month today, starting out laying the foundation is to really break down what is a spirit of fear so that we can have what it says in Proverbs four or five. It says, get wisdom, exclamation point, get understanding, exclamation point. Because what I would argue, brothers and sisters, is that what we struggle with is that understanding piece, right? We can know what the word of God says logically, right? But if we lack understanding as to how the enemy uses things against us, right? How our experiences or whatnot influence what we struggle with today, then we're going to still struggle, even though we have the healing power, even though we have complete fulfillment, even though we have everything we need in our spiritual DNA, amen, we still struggle in the natural because our soul and our body still seem to be paying attention to things, right, that aren't necessarily what the word of God are implying. So let's talk about that for a minute. All right. So where does the spirit of fear come from? So that's kind of the million dollar question today as we talk about it, because we know that it doesn't come from God. And yet we still know that a spirit of fear continues to bind many of us and prevent us from fulfilling the call of God that we have on our lives, walking in victory, being a walking testimony. Right. But we're going to start knocking down and chiseling some walls down today. Amen. I'm excited about this. This is a word from the Lord. So let's go to where it all started. And we all know a whole lot of things happened in Genesis chapter three. But what I'm going to argue today, though, is that I want many of us to understand that we can talk about the fall kind of generically. But what I want you all to see with your spiritual eyes, like in Second Kings six, it's like Elisha said, God, show him, reveal to him. We have more for us and against us. Right. He was looking in the natural. Right. His servant is the same sort of vibe right now. Really put on your spiritual eyes because a lot of things happen at the fall. And we know that. But we're going to break down some things that speak to a spirit of fear that I think we need to do some explaining about. All right. So let's go to Genesis chapter three. And we're going to start out in about verse six. So we know Genesis three. All right. So verse six, here's what it says. It says we'll go to about verse 10. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate, right? Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. We're going to break this down in a minute. Let's go to verse eight. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So you can kind of picture them hiding behind trees, right? Okay, verse nine. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you, right? And verse 10, so he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And you know how the story goes. God said, who told you you were naked, right? And you know, clearly he knew who told him, but nonetheless, he was wanting him to say, so let's break this down for a bit, okay? Because this is very important. So when we talk about a spirit of fear, we know we have two trees in the garden, right? We have the tree of life and we have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And ultimately as believers, this is for somebody right now, draw, we got to draw a line in the sand and say, what tree am I going to decide to live my life from? Amen? Am I going to live my life from the tree of life, all right? So the truth of God's word, or am I going to decide to live my life like much of the world, right? From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's essentially what went down here in the garden, right? So, 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 so let's take a look at this. So what happened here? We know that all sin in, entered into the world. Man gave dominion over to Satan. We know all the consequences of the fall, but there's one here that I really think are going to set some folks free who are watching this. Amen. So let's watch this. So if we look at verses six through 10, here's what we see. It says that they sewed fig leaves together. Now, I want you to understand the emotions behind doing so. What that implies is that the emotions of shame and the emotions of embarrassment entered into the world in that instant in time. Now, I want us to think about that. Shame, right? 
committing some sort of moral violation or code that I have, I mean, think about that even in the natural, that has a negative social scrutiny attached to it, right? Very similar to social anxiety, right? Embarrassment, same thing. There's an audience involved, right? So shame and embarrassment officially entered the world at that moment, right? But let's keep looking. What about them hiding themselves when they heard the sound of God walking? Now, we all know that they spent every minute, every hour with the Lord, walking all the time with him. So they heard the sound of God on a regular basis in the garden. But notice something this time, though. It says that they hid themselves when they heard. That's when the emotion of anxiety entered into the world. Are y'all seeing that? Anxiety, which we'll elaborate on next lesson, right? But essentially, anxiety is a future-oriented emotion, right? I'm not anxious right now as we're speaking because you know you're right here with me in the room per se. Anxiety is always about what if, right? The potential of threat. So we're saying they're not even seeing God, they heard God. Now I want someone to think about that as it relates today to some things we struggle with. Think about it. Anxiety is about that upcoming fill in the blank. Anxiety is about the speech that hasn't in fact happened right? Anxiety is about that job interview coming up. It's not right now in this moment. It's always about the future. Y'all seeing that? So anxiety, hearing the Lord, the same Lord, right? That represented all goodness, the same Lord that was the sustainer, the same Lord who was the provider, the same God, right? You see that? That they heard on a regular basis now represented a trigger of anxiety. Tuck that away. That's important. And then Adam, when he fessed up, said, that I was afraid. So when they were in the presence of God, then we saw the emotion of fear enter into the world. Now I want y'all to see that. So we see shame, we see embarrassment, and we see fear, right? And fear, and we'll elaborate on this as we move forward, but fear is always about present danger, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words. I'm gonna say a lot of these concepts in the future, but fear always is about present danger. Now, I'm just going to get somebody to tuck this away, but fear and panic are literally the exact same thing. And I've said that in the past, but understand that fear and panic are the same process. But fear is about present danger. I'm seeing you right now, right? Again, the same God, right? The same provider, the same sustainer, the representer of all love, the essence of love is all of a sudden, because I took a bite of that fruit, representing this emotional experience of fear. But notice it's not God. We already established that in the, with the spiritual scripture, right? In terms of me being one with the Lord, me being one with him, right? Me having a spirit, a soul, and a body. So now what we're seeing now is we're experiencing some emotions that we were not intended to experience. I hope you all see that. Now, what I would say here, which is so incredibly important, is that as we're kind of continuing to elaborate and underscore this idea of a spirit of fear, it's really important to understand that, again, the word of God says God didn't give us a spirit of fear. And we're going to break down and define what that is here in a minute. But I just want us to be on the same page and see that it was never God's intent. Right. For emotions like shame, embarrassment, anxiety and fear. So many things that many of us still struggle with today, even those tuning in right now. Right. Standing on the word of God, knowing what the word of God says about me knowing that I am beautifully and wonderfully made, knowing that perfect love casts out fear, declaring the right things. But there's something still not essentially effective, the working, right, in my life, because I know that's true in the spirit, and yet I still struggle. So it's like, Dr. Kevin, like, what is it going on here with this spirit of fear? Like, help me understand this, okay? So what we're saying now is, number one, we know that we are one spirit with the Lord, so we know that's not our issue, right? But we also know that all bad things, right, as we gave dominion over to Satan, and of course, praise God, Jesus restored that dominion over in Matthew 28, it talks about that, and then gave us power with the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But the bottom line there is that when we gave dominion over to Satan, right, in that moment in time, that's when the spirit of fear entered the world. So here's what I would suggest as we think about these things with shame, embarrassment, we call it wrath. With wrath, is really just dysregulated anger. Too much anger is too intense, right? Because you know the word of God tells us to be angry. We'll talk about that too later. But anger is one of those emotions that we do experience. But wrath, on the other hand, is not. 
So shame, embarrassment, anxiety, and fear. Now, this is interesting because even scientifically, what we know about people, so follow me, as we think about it as believers, we know a spirit of fear. We know there's that spiritual component. And it's really interesting because here's what science says. It confirms it. There's a trait that is responsible for what we call all emotional disorders, which we'll get to, and we call it neuroticism. Many of us have used that term loosely. Oh, you're so neurotic. Oh, you know, kind of like a pejorative sort of term, right? But let me tell you what neuroticism means and tell me, tell me brothers and sisters that that's not what we're describing right now that happened in the garden. Neuroticism is defined as a tendency to experience negative emotions coupled with the perception that the world around me is threatening and that I'm ill-equipped to cope with it. So think about that. A tendency to experience negative emotions, meaning some people, have you noticed, even believers who know who they are in the Lord and yet they have really big feelings, right? It's like if I get anxious, it's big. If I get sad, it's really low, right? If I get angry or what people call now like younger folks, salty, right? It's like big salty, right? Big frustrated. It's like I have this tendency to have these strong emotions. Y'all ever see that? Y'all see what I'm talking about? And what we know scientifically that confirms what the word of God tells us is that with the fall, neuroticism, that tendency to experience shame, to experience embarrassment, because some people experience it much more frequently and higher than other people, that tendency came from Genesis chapter three. So that entered into the world, right? It entered into the world and people start passing that down in many ways. Y'all see that? And what we know about neuroticism that's consistent with what we saw in the garden, right? When Jesus said, who told you you were naked and whatnot, is that there's two issues. One, people who struggle with this tendency, even believers, I see them all the time. I mean, I work with thousands of people, right? Who come in and they know what the word of God says, right? They're born again believers. They pray the right things. They declare the right things in the atmosphere, right? But they still struggle. And they're like, what am I missing here? Is it a lack of faith? No, right? So we're not condemning that. We, we already know because, you know, a lot of people will say, well, it's just your faith. No, no, nope, we're rebuking that right now. The bottom line is that it's understanding that's lacking. Amen. It's understanding. So what we're doing right now, even in the midst of this, is trying to break down that concept of how do we know, how do we understand better, right? How do we have brothers and sisters in the Lord and the, even in the scientific community who are there for ministry purposes to break down these concepts to help me, my family members and whatnot, navigate that soul, right? And that body that's preventing me from letting my spirit man be activated, amen? Praise God. So what I'm getting at here is that people who struggle with that tendency toward neuroticism they have two issues there. Number one, they view emotions, negative emotions as dangerous. So in other words, there's this negative view. Like if I get angry, that's bad. That's wrong. I got to push it away. Right. So what they do is they avoid emotions. In other words, I try my best to avoid the experience of anger, to avoid the experience of sadness. Right. Ecclesiastes talk about how sadness is important, but that's another conversation to avoid the experience of um, shame and embarrassment and whatnot. Now, these don't feel good to be clear. But the key here is that when I push those away and avoid them, they backfire if I don't understand them and intensify the very symptoms I'm trying to manage. So there's two issues. One is that people who have this tendency toward, you know, oh, I had to, I sew fig leaves on, essentially panicking, having fear, having a lot of worry, having a lot of anxiety, which will break down another um, and next week, for example. But the key here is that they avoid emotions, number one. And number two, they have what's called avoidant behaviors right? So often in the body of Christ, we try to push things away, right? It's like, oh, I'm not going to, it's one thing to meditate on negative things and sinful thoughts and whatnot. That's one thing. That's not what I'm saying. Y'all know that. But what I'm saying is that when we avoid, we're not picking our sword up, right? We're not taking thoughts captive. Taking a thought captive, which we'll talk about later, is essentially taking it, take a hold of it, right? Taking a hold of it and being aggressive and fighting, right? We'll get to that. So what I'm saying here is that we tend to have this tendency to struggle with having negative emotions frequently and intensely. And then we have what's called avoidant behaviors. Think about anything that people struggle with that's related to emotions, right? 
people who have a tendency to struggle with anything related to emotions, PTSD symptoms, right? Worry behavior, social anxiety, OCD, phobias, right? And we'll get to that too, right? All of those things, depression, all of those are predicted by the tendency toward high neuroticism. The number one risk factor for emotional disorders spiritually is we'll say a spirit of fear, which we'll define in a minute. And scientifically, the same thing that we call a spirit of fear is essentially what we call neuroticism. That's what feeds it. That's the natural explanation, right? But we know that there's the spiritual piece to it because essentially it happened in Genesis chapter three. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna break that thing down. All right, so let's talk about a spirit of fear. Okay, so a spirit of fear, right? We know that we gotta put it in context. So the word spirit there comes from the Greek word pneuma. It literally means like a wind, to blow, but it means invisible, immaterial. You can't see it, but it also means powerful, right? They think that oftentimes when you have a strong emotional experience, many times people are like, man, like I just can't put my finger on it, right? But it's really uncomfortable, right? That's what we're talking about, that spirit piece, right? And in this context, it's talk talking about timidity. So when we talk about 2 Timothy 1.7, for God didn't give us a spirit of fear, it literally is translated there, timidity, being timid, right? shy or not aggressive in that context. So that's the spirit explanation. So that to the wind, to blow, the invisible, the immaterial, the powerful, it's powerful. You know, if anybody's ever had a panic attack, for example, right? Like that's something that is very, very, very uncomfortable. It's a powerful experience and we can eliminate that, praise God. And y'all saw, you know, um, recently that um, the last guest on talked about that, right? So this is really ironic and divine appointment. So with that being said, that's the spirit part. What about the word fear? The word fear in the Greek, the noun comes from the Greek word phobos, which is really interesting because that literally means to cause to fight or flee or to cause dread or terror. We know that the fear response, ironically, is what we call fight, flight, or freeze. Many people might be thinking, well, when is the freeze response helpful? Well, if you're, say, in Colorado <laughs> and encounter a mountain lion, I'm quite certain you're not trying to fight and you probably don't need to run. Freezing is your best option, right? You see what I'm saying? So I say that to say that the word phobia literally translates from that word phobos in the Greek. The word fear, right, comes from phobos, which is where we get the word phobia from. So just to define that briefly, a phobia is a, ironically, a persistent fear, right? of an object or situation, right? That is cued by the presence or the anticipation. Are y'all seeing that? Cued by the presence or anticipation of that object or situation. So we get that word fight or flight from that word fear there. But the other definition in the Greek though, of, of fear though, the feminine though, is comes from what we call dahlia. And that essentially means fearfulness. So taken together, a spirit of fear in the context of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it essentially is saying that we have this invisible, immaterial, powerful fearfulness. Y'all see that? So in other words, this idea of cowardice and timidity is what's so strong. So here's what, now drum roll. So what are we saying? So Kevin, what do we mean when we say a spirit of fear, right? We realize that we know that it didn't come from God, right? Check mark. We know that it's not our spirit. Check mark. We know we have two other parts though. We have our soul and we have our body. And because we live in a fallen world, what we're getting at here is because of the fall of man and giving dominion over to Satan, even though Jesus restored that, amen, praise God. We still struggle in our soulless realm, our emotional, our mental capacity, our memory associations, the things we learned in childhood, the things modeled by parents and whatnot, right? So we're talking about the things we learned to integrate into our minds that though we know the word of God is true on the inside of us from a spiritual standpoint, many of us stay bound because our attentional focus is still on the things based upon our emotional experiences. In other words, Romans 12 too, it stems from this idea that I'm not transformed because I'm still having these emotional experiences because of neuroticism, right? That we can reprogram, praise God. 
but that's my experience and that's what I'm paying attention to and that's what I'm trying to push away. So let's define that again. So a spirit of fear, if we take together the words pneuma, right? And we take the word dilea, even phobos, we take the spirit and we take the fear and put it together. Brothers and sisters, here's really the definition of what we're talking about. When we say a spirit of fear, what we're talking about is what I define as chronic fearfulness. Chronic fearfulness. Amen. So what we're talking about when we say a spirit of fear is we're saying that it's not occasional, right? It's not here and there. If I have a job interview and I have butterflies in my stomach, normal, right? If my kid's going off to college, which mine is, by the way, she's going to care. But my kid's going off to college, me getting a little anxious, right? Experiencing anxiety, you know, with her getting there versus having chronic experiences of anxiety and focusing on it. Those are separate. Chronic fearfulness is essentially what we mean when we say a spirit of fear. So what's that look like in the natural? Chronic fearfulness is essentially what we call emotional disorders. It's those things that we're treating on, on a regular basis. It's the things that even brothers and sisters in the Lord are still struggling with. It's depression, right? It's panic disorder. It's agoraphobia. It's OCD, right? It's trichotillomania. What's that, Dr. Kevin? Well, that's hair pulling, right? It's extreme nervousness, nail biting, right? There's a lot of names for these conditions. I'm not big on diagnostic labels, to be very clear. And the people that we see and treat on a regular basis, right? People who are believers and even non-believers, they get, they get better in a very short amount of time because it's all based on this idea of understanding and my ability to reprogram, right? those things that are triggering me to have these emotional experiences. So chronic fearfulness is manifested through the things that we diagnose, right? So let's call it what it is, right? So depression, OCD, social anxiety, panic, agoraphobia, phobias, right? People don't like to fly on airplanes. People don't like needles, shots, things like that. Julianne and I talked about all this last month, but we need a spiritual understanding of these things because we throw around the term, a spirit of fear pretty loosely in the body of Christ. And I think because of that, again, Proverbs 4, 5, get wisdom, get understanding. Brothers and sisters, we need to know what that means when we say a spirit of fear. And what we're saying based on what the word of God is saying here and the Greek translations of these, of these words is that it simply means chronic fearfulness that stems from the fall that was passed down, right, for many people, and I'm not talking about what people call generational curses. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about many people do have a tendency because of the fall to have a tendency to have these big feelings. And based on my learning in the environment, the enemy uses learning experiences to teach you that those emotional experiences that you have are somehow dangerous and threatening. And your brain, which is a powerful thing, right, reminds you when you encounter situations that this thing that's not in fact dangerous is. Man, it's powerful. So if we get a hold of that and understand that the issue here is essentially that I've had a tendency in the natural to struggle with chronic fearfulness, right? I've learned these associations in my brain, but the good news is that we can reprogram that through the word of God. And it's not just declaration, as you're gonna see as we navigate the month of August, it's not just declaring the right things. Right. It's making sure that the seed of the, of the word of God is in your heart, plant it deeply. But there's also behavioral change. Amen. There's also physiological things that are going to need to happen. Right. There's also thinking things that need to happen. And I cannot wait to unpack many of these concepts because it's going to be so liberating to so many people. So I just want to conclude with uh, first Peter, chapter two, verse 24. Y'all know what it says. It says for by his stripes. What? We were healed. So for somebody watching this, I just want you to know that despite how you feel in your body, despite what it seems like, right? Despite what the doctors have said to you, we know that there's facts and we know there's truth. We're making the decision to know that despite what I'm told through science, despite what I'm told through medical examination, the word of God says I was healed. Amen. Well, I feel like my heart's racing, but I'm still healed. You see what I'm saying? So though there's might be facts, we know that there's a truth in the word of God that tells us that we are absolutely healed. Our task now is for us to be able to get our spirit 
lined up, right? With what we're experiencing in our soul, our emotional experiences, our brain activity, all that soul and our body, which I would argue is not only just the flesh and the physical part, but it's also the physiological piece. And we're going to talk more about that, you know, in the, in the next message that I have, we're going to break down what I call the essence of a spirit of fear next time when you tune in. So we're gonna start breaking down concepts to say, all right, now that I know what a spirit of fear is, like what do I need to do now to further understand? Proverbs 4, 5, wisdom and understanding. How do I understand my emotional experiences? This chronic fearfulness that we call a spirit of fear, how do I now reprogram that, Dr. Kevin? So what we're gonna talk about, and I cannot wait, because the Lord has given me a word, and uh, I cannot wait for you all to grab a hold of it uh, and to teach it because it's going to be powerful. And if you all need to reach out again, please feel free. I'm, I'm, I'm that person. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen. I love y'all. Right. So, you know, Julianne's probably more on 10 than me, but, you know, I, I'm a social version or I'm a male version in that regard. I love y'all. Right. I love everybody who's watching this. Amen. So if you want to reach out to me, please feel free. Um, my email address is Kevin at KY cards. That's KY like Kentucky cards, C-A-R-D-S, Kevin at KYcards.com. You can find me. You can check out the website, Kevin, um, Dr. Kevin Chapman.com, I should say, as well as um, KYcards.com. But I love y'all. And uh, we're going to break this down even further. We, we're just setting the table for this particular message. But next time we're going to talk about um, the essence of a spirit of fear and break down some concepts to get us prepared for the rest of August, where we start getting into the to the meat and potatoes and starting to talk about, well, how do we take these captive? What do I have to do on a practical level to counter these things? How do I reprogram like the word of God says that I can and should? Amen. Can't wait for that. I love y'all. Y'all take care.